Welcome to this final edition of Washington Policy on the Go, final edition for 2022 anyway, um, and uh, glad to be here. This is, of course, a big holiday week with Christmas coming up, and uh, many of you are off work, many of you might be out of your routine, uh, but we thought you know, since since we've do it, been doing every other week, in fact, you know, here at the office, we've got a lot of people out on vacation, but we still have new research showing up, new, new analysis of state policy, and I thought, why not keep it going for those of you who are still still at your desks and, uh, and, and still working, and uh, maybe some of you who have the time off feel more relaxed and able to join us for this uh, final episode of Washington Policy on the Go. Uh, remember, for those of you who haven't been here in a while, we have a, a relatively new format where if you have a question for the center director we're talking to, uh, ask that question right away via the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, put that question in because once once we close off that interview, it's gone. So we're going to ask the questions. I'll, I'll incorporate them into the uh, live uh, interview. And that way, we don't have to wait till the very end. It keeps the questions fresher and gets them answered right away if you have questions about what we're talking uh, about. Um, I also want to remind you, even though uh, our center directors are on vacation, they tend to update the blog anyway. So over the holiday season, I know a lot of you aren't going to be thinking too much about state policy uh, when it comes to Christmas and New Year's, uh, but we're there for you. Uh, and there's a lot that happens from time to time because uh, this this relatively dead period is also a great time to dump bad news so, uh, for if you're a um, uh, if you're in government. So watch for that. Check out our blog. You don't have to check it out every day, but check it out while you're. Uh, on vacation while you're uh, thinking about other things makes for great uh, topics of conversation uh, stuff to bring up to those college students who are super progressive and excited coming home uh, after uh, after hearing a bunch of things without context in the in their colleges and you should pick up a copy of Todd's book and gift them uh, that as well so they can bring it back and share some environmental good news for once uh, to the uh, college of their choice. Today, we'll be speaking with our director uh, for our initiative on agriculture, as well as uh, Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment director. Again, make sure you um, put your questions into the Q&A box right away. Uh, if you, uh, if I'm speaking uh, to one of the center directors and you have that question, put it in right away because we're going to incorporate, incorporate it uh, relatively quickly, and that way everybody is um, uh, all the questions will be answered before we let any center director go. Let's start with Pam Lewison. She is our uh, initiative on agriculture director. And Pam, you've got um, a new blog out about why agriculture might be rethinking some of the food labeling. And that food labeling, I think, what is it? You called it cool? Was that is that the acronym using? What, what does that stand for? Why is it cool? Uh, it's called country of origin labeling. Uh, and so it's shortened to cool. Yeah, um, as we I like guess fonds have. didn't work, so cool was, was yeah. it. So, so what's going wrong? Why why are they rethinking? Uh, you know, so cool has been around for a long time. It's uh, it was originally instituted about twenty years ago, and it was really meant to be a way to sort of market local um, meat in particular, but also produce and, and nuts and some other things um, to a U.S. audience and say, hey, you're getting something that was grown here, um, fed here, harvested here, um, or at least to provide some sort of transparency if it wasn't a US product, you could, um, you could identify on the package, uh, you know, where it's born, raised and harvested uh, with a, you know, there's an abbreviation for Canada, for Mexico and other places as well. Um, and as we have gone through the cool process, um, it was revoked, uh, in 2015, I believe, um, because of a WTO ruling, World Trade Organization ruling, about um, fair fair market practices, and um, WTO's ruling effectively said that uh, it wasn't a fair marketing practice to mandate the labeling of where uh, meat, in particular, came from. Huh. Um, but as we get into this next congressional session, um, the farm bill is up for a renegotiation and renewal. And there's a lot of talk around including a mandatory country of origin label um, protocol into the new farm bill. Um, I would argue and data would argue that uh, cool doesn't work really 
It doesn't do what it was intended to do, which was spur local people to buy local products. Uh, and I think it has a lot to do with um, how we talk about food now. We need to talk about food in terms of the person who grew it, not the country where it's from. And there's a lot of data that supports um, that consumers are more apt to buy a product from someone that they know. Uh, so person. who's the, when you, when you say we need to talk that way, who's the we? The, I, you know, I think right? it's, it's everyone in the food supply chain. I think we need to sort of change how we, um, how we market and manage food production. So um, whether it's uh, my husband and I with our beef that we grow and um, some of which we sell, uh, or it's your neighbor down the street who you buy eggs from. You're more apt to buy from someone that you know, someone you have a personal connection with, rather than um, looking at uh, the array of, say, beef in the in the grocery store and saying, oh, well, this one says it's from the U.S., so I'm going to buy that one instead of this one that says it's from Canada. Because in the grocery store, it's driven by price, unless there is something else to motivate you to buy something different. And that is often feeling like you have a connection to the person who grew that meat or who grew those vegetables or fruit. So is there an example of, um, of this? I mean, one, it sounds like whatever modifications there are to cool, it doesn't really matter because it wasn't really working as it was intended to anyway. And then two, is there an example of uh, the kind of advertising that you're talking about or the kind of, of, of uh, way of marketing where uh, there's been success for uh, farmers and, um, and agribusinesses in terms of relating you know, themselves to other families? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, the example that I have in my blog, I have two different ones. The first is uh, when smartphones first became a big thing and everybody had them, uh, egg producers in Germany actually did a, a, a little study. They kind of did a little experiment and they put a scannable code on egg cartons. And that code, if you scanned it with your phone, would bring up a little bio of either the farm owner or one of the owner's employees and it would tell you a little, you know, a little bit about them, who they are and where the farm is located, you know, roughly and um, what their practices are in terms of how they grow their chickens and how they care for them. And uh, what that study found was that people were more inclined to buy the eggs with the story code rather than eggs that didn't have the story code because they had a window into how those chickens and, and by extension, those eggs were produced. And so they felt like they belonged to them. Uh, and we see similar marketing pushes with um, companies like Sargento Cheese, I think is a great example, because they often um, tell stories that are personal about uh, you know, how they got into the business of making cheese and how uh, that translated into what you see now in the grocery store in terms of those pre-sliced items. I didn't see that coming, although it reminds me of, um, oh, there's a red wine or a I, maybe it has more than one brand, but it's uh, 13 Crimes or something where you scan the bottle and the face becomes animated and tells the story of the crime the guy's been convicted of. It's kind of creepy, mm -hmm. but I'm picturing the same thing now on a thing of eggs where you've got the chicken telling you <laughs> about the people and and uh, make people more likely to buy that. Got a question coming in. When choosing apple juice, I get the store brand 50 cents less than the Washington State Treetop. The store brand has tiny print on it that says concentrate from China. Treetop is made by folks who pay taxes. Why don't suppliers have a U.S. flag on products from the USA? So it, it goes back to um, those rules about country of origin labeling and um, specifically the way that the wording of the WTO ruling uh, laid out is that um, US producers could not have a, a sort of ubiquitous or really large label that said, uh, you know, this product is from the US over this product over here that's from China, for example. Um, and the other part of that is 
that I think there's other ways to get loyalty from consumers. It's, you know, for us, um, you know, my dad was um, an orchard kid in the Yakima Valley where treetop is located. And so anytime we see a treetop something, we will buy that over, uh, over a sort of generic brand because again, there's that personal connection to the product. There's an, another comment here, but it, it builds on what you were talking about with those personal connections. Um, this is from Sam. He says, at Resilient Veterans, we're out on the tip of the spear with labeling and marketing locally grown ag products. At Farmer Veteran Coalition, we hold the trademark to Homegrown by Heroes, and we also work with Hives for Healing, which is the veteran-owned beekeeper group. So it'd be a similar kind of thing there. We're giving people a, a personal reason why uh, to be with these these, what's what's the difference, by the way? We've I've seen studies like this with um, environmental products, which I'm sure Todd can relate to. Where you know, in Was Washington and and Oregon are particularly uh, eager to pay a premium for environmental um, products. And I'm wondering, what's is there any study that you know of, or is there any indication of what the premium is? I mean, you know, you said people differentiate by price in the grocery store, but is there you know, how much is that personal connection worth? You know, is it 10 cents is it, or 10%, or 5%, or do we even have any idea? You know, there's there's sort of a long running joke among some farmers, particularly with things like uh, organic produce, that it's a 30% price markup uh, for 30% less quality. Now, you know, whether that's true or not is a different story, but organic produce in particular is more expensive than conventionally grown produce. And when you look at that, a lot of it is really about virtue signaling. Uh, it's, it's about um, sort of the better thans. And that's often what we, um, what we see with those sorts of, uh, sort of shopping trends is what you're really talking about um, is I'm going to buy this because I believe it's better. Uh, whether you believe it's better for your health or um, nutritionally more valuable, uh, Stanford says it's not. Uh, you know, there's there is actually a study that says um, conventionally grown produce and organic produce nutritionally are the same. Um, but we have been taught to keep up with our you know keep up with the Joneses, um, and that it has extended into how we purchase food. We got another question, and then we'll, I want to get into uh, the blog you wrote about changes in feeding regulation because, you know, regulation matters <laughs> and it, it can uh, potentially increase prices and other things. So um, this question is from Jason. Why do U.S. food producers need to abide by some WTO ruling any more than some opinion from a G8 or WEF member? Because we are a global um, trade partner. So uh, Washington in particular, uh, the ag community is very trade dependent. And so we as a nation have to abide by those rules um, to participate in that organization. And as uh, sort of by extension, to be able to send our products overseas and sort of reap the benefit of, of that uh, income. All right, turning to, toward your other blog uh, regarding the concentrated animal feeding operations permitting rules, how have, how have they changed and what's, uh, what's the impact for the industry and is there an, in, any impact for consumers? So there shouldn't be a whole lot of consumer impact with the new uh, concentrated animal feeding operation or CAFO rules. Um, they're really just rules of operation and how um, farmers and ranchers in Washington in particular, uh, manage the waste from their uh, livestock. Uh, what's interesting about this is um, originally, there was, no, um, there was no size, animal size or herd size named in, um, in the Department of Ecology's permitting rules. So uh, they were intentionally vague because if you are, if you have, 5,000 head of cattle, and you are following all of the rules for water quality management, and you're doing everything right, um, under the old ruling, you should never have to have a permit for your 
um, feeding operation. Um, the reverse of that is if you are a small operation and you have, you know, say less than 50 head of cows um, and you are, you know, fouling the streams with, um, uh, with waste or you're um, improperly applying your, um, you know, your liquefied manure to a field for fertilizer, then um, you would, you'd get tagged and need a permit. And what that permit basically does is forces you as an operation to have a plan for how you're going to manage these waste runoffs. But Don, uh, I, I mean, that, that's what kind of surprised me about this blog because I, I felt like, um, you know, farmers and others that there are already plans for these kinds of things. So how does this change that? What, what, so is there think, new mandates on the plans or where they turn them in or? So the way that it works now is there's actually a definition for herd size, um, and you can get a permit in two ways. You can either voluntarily go in and say, you know, I'd like to have a permit, so I have a management plan in place um, preemptively, uh, or you can uh, operate in what you believe is um, a safe manner, and hopefully uh, ecology doesn't come by and say, as it turns out, you need a permit because this stream down here is now ruined. <laughs> um, so I think there's um, the real change is in that definition of herd size and um, that ecology's preference is if you have less than um, 200 head of cattle in particular um, or less than uh, a, a lot of chickens, <laughs> it's over a hundred thousand. But if you have less than those numbers, um, they would rather work with you than have to issue you a permit and potentially a fine. Um, most feeding operations voluntarily have sort of a waste management plan. The other thing that this, um, this new ruling does is narrow down when and how you can apply that waste, particularly in a field. So a lot of, a lot of dairies use their manure waste uh, as a way to fertilize their fields, which is great because they're, you know, they're sort of recycling their waste and using it uh, in a better way. But uh, the caveat to that is if there's been more than three inches of um, precipitation or irrigation applied to that field now, uh, you cannot apply your manure waste on top of it because too much of that will run off rather than being soaked into your field. Would that apply to all, I mean, I, 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 would that apply to all topographies? I mean, I, I would think that some some places that might be true and other places that might not be. So they're applying that um, to all topographies and to all parts of the state. Uh, it gets complicated when you're somewhere, say in Western Washington, where there's obviously a lot more precipitation uh, because you're gonna have to figure out how to time those applications such that you're not in violation of the rule. In Eastern Washington, it's easier, we're drier. And so you have less opportunity you have less opportunity to be in violation of that, but it is still possible. Um, all in all, do you give these uh, new regulations any grade, you know, in terms of uh, necessity, um, you know, any you know, particular value? I give them a B minus. <laughs> I would really, because I would really like to see, uh, I like the ambigu ambiguity that was there before, um, because if you are a small operation and you're not, doing the right things, then certainly you should be held accountable for that. And if you're a large operation and you're doing all the right things, then you should also get credit for your effort. Um, and I think having a sort of arbitrary herd size or flock size um, applied leaves some room for, um, we'll call it human error in how uh, you're managing those waste products. <laughs> Final question for you it comes from Carolyn. Um, she wants to comment. Are you familiar with the PCC community markets in the western part of Washington that preserve local farmland and foster high standards by partnering with Northwest producers, farmers, ranchers, and makers? They have food buying clubs in the Seattle area. Uh, any comment? So I am um, sort of marginally familiar with them. I, I uh, am a firm believer in maintaining whatever food production land we can have. Um, but 
the sort of caveat to that is um, a lot of farmers are starting to age out of farming. And when you get to that sort of point where you don't want to work long hours and it's tiring and um, you're looking at regulations and market headwinds and those sorts of things, if you don't have someone else who's willing to step into that role for you, um, most of those folks are looking at their land as their retirement account. Um, you know, in Western Washington, farmland that's close to an urban area can sell for a million dollars an acre, um, which is, a, you know, I mean, that's a huge amount of money. And when you look at the pressures that the ag community is under in Washington in particular, um, that rate of attrition of farmers, I think, is very high. Um, so I, I love any program or group that is willing to try to preserve farmland, particularly high quality farmland, and funnel the results of those efforts to local folks first. Um, because again, you have that direct connection between your grower and your consumer, uh, where in some cases you're literally handing a product over the farm gate to the person who's going to eat it. But um, I think that's something that we are in danger of losing because of the amount of regulation um, placed on farmers in Washington. I knew a farmer who was offered a million dollars an acre for uh, for some of his land near a, on, on the west side near a development and, and a major shopping center wanted to wanted to be there a major outlet and uh, he ended up passing away before he could take advantage of it. But uh, but his widow, um, there was a, a property dispute on the line about 20 feet either way. And at the end, the developer just said, I'm going to pay you both as though you owned the, the whole thing to get this out of the way. And they're like, yes, OK. So it was sad to see it go. But uh, but you're right. I mean, that's that's what happens if, if the farming can't can't make it. They're going to sell it. And uh, and there's a uh, there's a, a major well visited uh, uh, retail outlet there now. Um, Pam, Merry Christmas to you. Looking forward to the new year and, and uh, the excitement of the legislative session coming up in January. So we'll, yes. we'll have a lot more to to, uh, uh, to look forward to. I want to point out to everybody, we've got a couple of new um, animated videos on agriculture policy on our YouTube channel. You can go to the Animate This. Some of you might see it um, stream uh, for, over the course of the next month or so. It'll be... Uh, um, you know, there's a streaming promotion of those videos as well. So you might see them, see them there as well. Pam, uh, thanks so much. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Happy New Year. Thanks, Dave. Merry Christmas. You bet. All right. Todd Myers joins us next. He is our Center for the Environment Director. And uh, Todd, it's, it's funny. Um, we'll talk about the impact on gas prices second. But um, I want you to know that I, I keep telling people about them as y your actual title is uh, something like the bad news and, and the less bad news, whereas I just keep calling it the bad news and the worst news, because in my mind, any price hike right now is so bad. Um, I'm just I'm just floored by it because I feel like everywhere I turn, there's a new price hike or some uh, public official is saying, well, we're just going to increase it a little bit. It's not that bad. And I want to know what planet they live on. And, you know, I, I guess coming from their perspective with the increase of government, maybe it's not bad. But for me, you know, when I'm looking at grocery bills and other things and, and talking with other people, the price hikes in any way are bad. So let's first, though, start with the bad um, problem that Washington State has been having lately with science. And let's start that on a micro level with the sentence you provided me prior, <laughs> prior to the show. I just I'm still blown away by this uh, this approach to science uh, that are um that our state is is taking. Um, why don't you share a little bit of that with us? So the governor's budget has about um, four million dollars in it for to develop a new science curriculum. But um, the Department of Health has already um, put together a science curriculum um, and on climate and justice. Um, and there are several things. One of them is about forest fires. That's why I started looking at it because I wanted to see what they said because they were talking about forest fires causing childhood asthma. Um, and so I wanted to look at what their science was. But what struck me was another curriculum packet they have on um, 
uh, climate change and pregnancy. And it starts out with the argument that maybe people shouldn't have children uh, because their life is going to be so miserable in the future under climate change that it would be horrible. So that's the premise. But in one of the slides, your, your child could end up like Greta, just depressed all the time, just obsessed with these uh, disasters and right. watch out for that. The thing is that that claim is totally ridiculous because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and everybody else says that actually the world would be richer in the year 2100 under any scenario. Um, so the people will be better off <laughs> um, 80 years from now than they are today under any scenario. So it's just the whole premise is nonsense. But you, it, it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise you that they say nonsensical things when what I found in one of the notes to one of the slides is this comment for teachers. For too long, science and science education have prioritized rational thinking. So in other words, the Department of Health says that science education has, has for too long prioritized rational thinking. This might explain some of our policies in recent years, uh, but it is an absolutely ridiculous thing to include in science education. The, the, the science is not the be all and end all, right? There are other things that are important, values, economics, all of those sorts of things. That's all great. Um, but saying that science um, should, should not uh, focus on rational thinking, it, it, it just is ridiculous. It undermines the value of science, um, especially coming from an agency that is supposed to be that constantly claims it is using, it is following the science. Um, and maybe I guess now we know why they're saying that because their definition of science is different than the rest of us believe, but it's, it, it, it was pretty shocking when I saw it. I'm just picturing if, if some major religious figure had made that statement for some right of center reason, you know that would there, there'd be headline making and discussions uh, around the nation about that ridiculousness, and yeah, I'm wondering if this um, approach from Washington State will get the same treatment. Um, and I'm I'm doubtful, but I'd like to see it because I'd like to see some public pressure put on this 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 approach. Is there a rationale that they give, Todd, or have you had time to get into it as far as why rational thought should take a back seat uh, on science? Well. <laughs> They argue that the that the feelings and values of different people aren't being taken into account, and of course, the whole argument is is that this uh, you know using focusing on rationality leads to racist outcomes. That's bizarre. That is essentially an argument that rationality um, that that uh, minorities and and uh, non-white people can't be rational. It's it, it, that is in itself racist. Um, but second, it leads to to worse outcomes. One of the things that they talk about is asthma. Well, so I used to run a statewide charity for people who couldn't afford prescription medicines. I worked in healthcare. Um, as childhood asthma um, is caused by a variety of things, but it's a lot of indoor air quality. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's poverty. I mean, lots of things that we can address. But if what you say is, no, 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 childhood asthma is caused by climate change, and that's where we need to focus our efforts, you are not helping children who are suffering from asthma overcome the problem because you're focusing on the wrong things. Because instead of rational thinking, <laughs> you are focusing on the disproportionate impact, which it, which it undoubtedly has. But if you want to address that disproportionate impact, you have to focus on the scientific causes. What are the real causes? And, and so it's really dangerous and pernicious to have this sort of nihilistic mindset, which says that rational thinking um, is overrated. And I just, it's, it's bizarre to me, but that is where we are um, in so much of our environmental and healthcare policy. We need some kind of a of a parody, like how the Grinch stole science in Washington State, and and uh, and roll with that around this time of year. Um, a lot of uh, folks are now asking, uh, "Hey, you know, is there a link to this document in the, you know, that you could send us right here?" And I just want to say right now, 
I want Todd to put it on the Washington Policy Center blog first and then have <laughs> everyone share it so that attention is focused on the Washington Policy Center. So as a greedy communications director, I'm going to say, <laughs> wait, Todd, don't give that out yet. Let's put it on the Washington Policy Center blog so that I can uh, so that I can cast a net far and wide. So those I, I hate to tell you. That, I as an outraged researcher, I've always I've already shared it on my Twitter feed. So oh, for God's you, sake, you, you can go to my Twitter feed at, at WA Policy Green. But I definitely will be writing about this. Yeah, uh, go to that Twitter feed, look at it there, make a mental note, and then share his blog so that it goes back to the website. This is why researchers should not be allowed Twitter accounts, <laughs> <laughs> or should have a some sort of a, a, a what a fifteen minute rule. Text it to me and say, should I? We should are, I? <laughs> <laughs> we, we are admittedly an unruly bunch. <laughs> That's right. All right. So um, we, we should talk about the, uh, as Casey points out, the not so good, the bad and the ugly of the potential gas, uh, well, it's tax on gas, not gas tax. We had a um, one media outlet issue, a fact check on on people <laughs> saying, well, there's a, it is not true that the gas tax is increasing, something that your research points out specifically a number of times. So I was marveling at the fact that a media outlet can can fact check something and say it's not true, even though the document itself that it's referring to specifically already says that. So I don't know who they're checking. But anyway, the prices on gas due to taxes are going to go up in 2023 because of the emissions tax or um, the, what is it, what, uh, Inslee calls it the, uh, Governor Inslee calls it the tax and invest scheme. Um, the, uh, cap and invest. Cap, cap and invest, that's right. And so um, you have some new information about that. Why don't you share some of that with us that, that you put on your blog? Yeah, just so people understand, it's not like a typical gas tax where it's like 10 cents a gallon or something like that. It, it is, the price is based on an auction because you have to buy a permit for every metric ton of CO2 you're going to emit or the fuels that you sell are going to emit. So if you're a gas distributor, you have to buy a permit for all the gas that you are um, selling. Now, if if people start using more gasoline, well, then the, then the market for permits um, there'll be more demand and less supply, and so the price will go up. If people don't use as much gasoline or natural gas for home heating, then the price will go down. So it's just a supply and demand, but it is a permit auction, not a flat tax. So that's why there is uncertainty about what the price is. The Department of Ecology hired a group called Vivid, which is part of McKinsey, to come up with a projection. What They looked at the supply and demand in the market and what they thought. They thought it would be $58 a metric ton, which comes out to about 46 cents a gallon in Washington state. So that's the that's where we get 46 cents a gallon. It's not my number, I didn't make it up, it's the Department of Ecology's number. Um, but again, it's speculation. It's it, We don't know what the actual market will be. Well, there's some small indication um, that it may be less expensive. So a group did a um, futures auction um, for permits in Washington state. So companies who want to hedge, who want to buy some futures permits early, they bid $35 a metric ton. Now it's very small. It's a very small amount of permits. So it may not be, you know, you, you may not be able to extrapolate to the full market, but $35 a metric ton is about 28 cents a gallon. So to your point, um, you know, saying the less bad news, 28 cents a gallon being the less bad news, uh, perhaps it's the Christmas season and I'm feeling charitable. Um, it's certainly better than 46 cents a gallon, but still is very expensive, obviously. Yeah, it's like, you thank you, sir. May I have another? And and you point yeah. out that it can't go beneath a certain amount either. So it's Correct. not like, you know, uh, I mean, we're you're going to get hit one way or the other. So the minimum price is $22 a metric ton. So even if there's very little demand, um, the, they still have to pay $22 a metric ton, which is about 17 to 18 cents a gallon. So that's the minimum that it can be. But the top is like $80 a metric ton, which is like 70 cents a metric gallon, 70 cents a, a gallon rather. So what's interesting is that the Department of Ecology says that it will cost only five cents a gallon. Now, the way they did that is that they ran it through a macroeconomic model, all the costs, and they said, oh, it's going to only be five cents a gallon. So think about what they're arguing. What they're arguing is, is that, let's say in the case of the 28 cents a gallon, that there'll be a 28 cent per gallon tax on the oil companies 
whom they and the governor constantly say are greedy and rapacious, but they will eat 23 cents of that 28 cents per gallon and just take it off the top of their profits. There's something about that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, we know that that's not the case. Numerous studies, economic studies have shown that for every penny of increase in gas taxes, you get an increase of one cent at the pump. Who says that? The Department of Ecology, because they actually did another study on the low carbon fuel standard, which is a, another rule that's going into effect next year. They had a different eco economic company look at that. And that analysis says very clearly that when you raise prices one cent a gallon, it increases gas prices one cent a gallon. So the Department of Ecology's own studies contradict each other on this. But the fact is the second study uh, is consistent with all of the other economic literature. And the claim that this will only cost five cents is wildly inconsistent with everything. You know, what's frustrating about that for me is, uh, you, you know, back to the fact check that media outlets put out. Um, I can't remember the last time I saw one that checked government numbers like that when, when there's claims and there's contradictory um, analysis. You know, I mean, you bring up things all the time like this, like the uh, Snake River dams and other things where, you know, a, a basic fact check could go back and take a look at their own numbers and say, all right, somebody's not telling the truth here, yeah. you know. So well, well, what's interesting is, is that in that fact check, they called somebody at University of California, Davis to say, what do you think? Do you think this number is accurate? And the University of California Davis person said, well, no, that's that's not gonna happen. It didn't happen in California. Okay, California's rules are different and their prices are different. Um, and California's, he said it, you know, it added about 10 to 15 cents a gallon. Correct. And the reason is, is that because the cost per metric ton in California is $20 a metric ton, which equates to about 15 cents a gallon. So he's actually confirming the logic that we used, but he didn't realize that the projections in Washington state are much higher than they are in California. So it, that's the thing is just because it didn't happen in California is a very different market. Um, so just because it didn't happen there doesn't mean it's not going to happen here. And by his own logic, we should see higher costs here. Well, is there any reason you can think of for that difference between the projected costs here versus California? There could be all sorts of reasons, right? The availability of alternative ways to meet the rule, carbon offsets, their targets could be different, the way they count could be different. I mean, there's the regulations um, are different in a lot of different ways. The market is also much larger. The other thing is, is that California is heavily subsidizing um, electric vehicles and other things like that. So while you don't see the cost in terms of gas prices, you may see the cost in terms of gas or uh, general taxes that go to subsidize other things. So it, it, it's the mix of policies and it's it's very difficult simply to say, well, it didn't happen in California, so it's not going to happen in Washington. Yeah, it's it's uh, um, it's amazing because if we were talking about, I mean, you know, three to five cent gas tax prices have been controversial in Washington state. So when we're talking about it, hey, it's, you know, a minimum here of what was the minimum uh, for the uh, uh, minimum increase here is about 17, five, 18, cents, 17 yeah. 18 cents. And then you can also bring up the, the I mean, my own view is that um, I'd rather have a 17, 18 cent gas tax increase than this, because at least then the money would be going to build or maintain our current highway system, which um, ever since Christine Gregoire was governor, or even, no, before then, when uh, Governor Locke was uh, running, they, we were told that, um, you know, that there was a, the, our roads and bridges were in a dangerous condition, desperate need of repair, could fall down at any moment. You know, there's this big list of all these uh, dangerous bridges if th that could cripple the state if there is uh, uh, any major earthquake event or anything. And, and that a lot of that backlog still exists. And then I think, okay, but now we're, we're going to have this big uh, price hike, but that money's not going to go to fix anything. It's not going to expand capacity for anything. You know, instead, we're just choking ourselves to death when it comes to uh, transportation infrastructure. Right. And that's and that's because the CO2 tax is not protected by the state constitution, whereas gas taxes are gas taxes have to be dedicated to road maintenance, road construction, things like that. Whereas the CO2 tax can be used for anything that 
uh, politicians want. And if you look at the governor's budget, proposed budget, where he lists all the things he wants to spend that money on, it's all over the map, including uh, climate curriculum. Back to the climate curriculum. I just love that story. (laughs) Good, good weaving. Uh, Speaking of which, you you point out in your blog there was a couple of other anti science things that that just slipped my mind. I was so distracted by the ridiculousness of removing rational thought from science. Um, There was the uh, uh, there was the announcement uh, very recently about um, uh, removing the permission that some have. Uh, for pen fishing, because there's no safe way to do uh, um, pen fishing, and you point net out pens, yeah. net pens, right, um, in um, in in our area, and uh, and that's going to affect uh, a tribe, that's going to affect a business, and you point out that the way they're approaching this announcement is unscientific. Describe that. Right. So, uh, Commissioner of Public Lands Hillary Franz, who oversees net pens because DNR manages the bedlands underneath the water. So if you want to have a net pen, you have to get a lease um, to be over that and to anchor. Um, and so Department of Natural Resources simply said, we're not, well, Commissioner Franz said, we're not going to do any more leases for any net pens. And in her announcement, she just said, there's no way to do them without risk. Okay. There's no way for me to leave my house without risk. Um, arguing that zero risk is the standard is uh, foolish for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is she, she cited no science, right, about what the damage is, what the harms were. She just said there's no zero risk way to do it. But NOAA Fisheries, the federal scientific agency that oversees you know, fisheries and, and protection of Chinook, threatened Chinook and other threatened species, did a study and said that the risks from net pens, in the case of the Jamestown Sklalem tribe for black cod and uh, cook aquaculture for steelhead were indiscernible. That was their word, indiscernible, which means essentially we can't, there's there's no impact, right? Um, So that's what their science said, but the commissioner just ignored that and said, well, there's no, zero risk way. But what's interesting is that she then says two things. One, you can put the net pens on land, that's fine. And two, that hatcheries are fine, especially tribal hatcheries. Well, tribal hatcheries are not, any hatchery is not zero risk. Ask any hatchery manager, they will tell you lots of risks of mismanaging hatcheries, whether it's about genetics, whether it's about putting too many fish in an ecosystem all at once, so they eat all of the uh, food available and out sort of out compete the wild fish I mean, all sorts of risks, things that you have to do to make sure that you're managing a hatchery well. And yet, in the same thing, she says we can't have net pens because they're not zero risk. She specifically supports tribal hatcheries, ignoring that same standard. Putting net pens on land is doable, but it's much more expensive and uses much more energy. Well, those have costs, right? Those create their own risks. So it's, it is, there is no good standard to make this decision. And rather than follow the science, which is what, you know, NOAA Fisheries is there to do the science, um, she just waved it off and chose a standard that can't be met by anything um, and that she herself ignores when it's convenient. Yeah, it's it's kind of like you mentioned earlier. There's the, there's no way you can leave your house without risk, but there's also no way you can stay home without risk because there's there's yeah. dangers in your house. You know, something could fall on you. You could trip. You could do all kinds of things. So um, that it's a it, it's strange to have the no standard, particularly when um, our governor has been um, identified by national media and, and regional media so often as, you know, kind of, and, and he's tried to identify himself as the pro-science, you know, I, I want to base my, I'm going to base my uh, pandemic response to on, on the science. I'm going to base my um, climate change metrics on science. And it's, it's always science, science, science. Uh, but then, you know, when you peer behind the headlines, it's not. And that's been a, that's been a kind of a persistent theme of Washington state, or, um, or, or maybe now what we've learned is, is that their definition of science says that rational thinking is overrated. So maybe it does. Maybe it is consistent in their minds. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great how you can just kind of change words to fit whatever meaning you want. That uh, that that happens. Well, um, Todd, uh, excellent blogs and excellent research as always. Looking forward to uh, seeing what you come up with in, in the new year. And 
Uh, I'm looking forward to the fact check on what happens with uh, gas prices uh, next. Well, I, I should I take that back. I'm not looking forward to what um, to finding out what happens with gas prices next year. I was finally breathing easy, paying what I used to think was an exorbitant rate of I think three sixty nine a gallon uh, recently. And I remember a time not long ago when I thought this is out outrageous. I can't believe this. And now I'm like, oh, thank you, thanks for the relief. Um, and then next well, year we have to look forward to increase prices again. And to your point on the fact check, like one of the things that we do is we stand behind our claims. Um, so I have offered to bet. So right now, Washington State, uh, last year we averaged about 60 cents a gallon higher than the national average for gas prices. So I am willing to bet that next year we will be about 80 cents a gallon, so about 20 cents. Now, the reason I give that less than the 46 and the less than the 28 is because the projections may be wrong. But I know the minimum is, like I said, 18 to 17 cents a gallon. So I think it's gonna be a little bit higher than that. Um, so I'm willing to bet that it will be 20 cents. It will not be the Department of Ecology's five cents a gallon. <laughs> um, so if people wanna bet $50 to charity is my standard bet. If they wanna bet that it's gonna be less than 20 cents a gallon um, over what it is now, I'm, I'm happy to take that bet. And, and by the way, the projections aren't our projections. They're not WPC projections. Right. They're state government projections. So, you know, basing you you base the amount of the increase on the the projections in that snapshot of time. So, you know, the last time it was forty six cents per gallon. Could still be that. You know, this latest information was a much was smaller, uh, and that would be what twenty eight thirty two cents somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be, if it's thirty-five dollars a metric ton, it's twenty-eight cents a gallon. Right, and you're, and and they're all claiming, oh, it's not going to be twenty cents a gallon. What are you crazy, uh, Todd? That's crazy. Uh, but you know, there's a, it's a basic mathematical formula. So unless you think uh, everybody on the back end is going to say, you know what, let's just eat these costs somehow. <laughs> let's eat these costs because consumers have been hit really hard. You know, and. Even if we have to function at a loss, let's just suck it up. Uh, take it for the team. You know, I, I always like going to happen when these things happen. When it's you know, it's the the governor and others say, "Oh, it's those the greedy um, gas companies, oil, gas, oil and gas companies that are raising prices and should they should absorb this for the good of the people." But the state won't cut taxes. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're not willing to cut their taxes, uh, the taxes that they take, the money that they take for the good of the people. It's everyone else who has to, so. Yeah, even when they have, you know, what, how many how many billions in surplus have we had recently? I mean, somewhere between 11 and 15. So it's, uh, and even then it's like, well, you know what? We can't, Sales tax got, what are you crazy? You know, we can't do that. So uh, anyway, Merry Christmas, Todd. I look forward to uh, seeing you in the in the new year. I like your festive sweater there. It's uh, you're out in, in the Snowyville. Um, most of Western Washington is, unfortunately. Uh, well, I guess most people would consider me fortunate, but there's no snow ab uh, out here at all. I say unfortunate because I got a bunch of kids that were just hoping for snow. Um, uh, you know, I don't mind if it if it delays a little bit because um, my lack of gloves, but. <laughs> But uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new year and and uh, man, be sure, folks, to check out the blog. I'm looking forward to your blog about the redefining of science so we can uh, share that far and wide. And I hope that uh, you will as well. Thanks for joining us on this last uh, episode of Washington Policy on the Go. I um, hope you uh, join us again next year. I think that we're going to start on the second week of January instead of the first week. Um, I'll have to confirm that with Donald when we set up the, the calendar again and that's mostly because it will be coming off of a very strange uh strange week which is always the week between christmas and new year's where people are very distracted and, and have a lot of family events so i'm um, looking forward to seeing you then uh thank you for joining us be sure to share this information with your friends and family and, and others and check out todd's new book if you need a last minute gift idea uh, go to amazon and look for time to think small uh, Todd's book, the perfect gift for college students and others who are um, who are sounding the alarm that what we desperately need to uh, to uh, keep the existential crisis at bay is a big government policy instead of uh, individual incentives and more and the embracing of new technologies. Uh, so check out Todd's new books, doing well on Amazon, 
uh, and you can find the link on WPC's webpage as well. Thanks for joining us and have a great holiday season.